Death and Serene A Short Horror Story Written by Michael Vandervoort Narrated by Robin McConnell Serene was nine the first time she saw him. She had been sitting on the bus with her mother, idly staring out the window at passing cars and watching as their headlights were blurred by the rain into sprays of colour like liquid fireworks when she had glanced toward the back of the bus and seen him standing there. Massive and unnervingly still, he had been leaning, almost hunched, over an old woman who was sitting in the aisle seat of the bus, clutching a large bag of potatoes. From his pose, Serene had assumed he was about to tell the old woman something that only the two of them needed to know. Instead, however, he raised his head slowly and looked directly at Serene. The dry, white bones of his face fixed into an ever-present grin, seemed somehow to smile even wider as he regarded her. His eyes, empty socket holes of unending depth, stared directly at her and showed, from somewhere within their dark pools, a glimmer of recognition. It was the first time that Serene had seen death, and death, it seemed, had felt it. It was as if he knew from the first instant that she had seen him and that he was being watched. As Serene tugged furiously on her mother's sleeve and pointed, the reaper raised a bony finger to where his lips might once have been, as if to say, Shh. What she had seen, he seemed to convey with his motion, was their little secret. She looked up at her mother, trying desperately to get her attention, but when she looked back, he had gone. For her part, the old woman staggered toward the front of the bus, rang the bell, and two stops later stepped off. Serene glared through the window, and as the bus pulled away, glimpsed the woman ambling slowly down the lane, and noted again that a few metres ahead, a tall, hooded figure stood waiting by the crossroads toward which the woman was inevitably headed. That, as far as she could remember, was the start of it. She remembered that she had looked back to where the woman had been sitting, at the seat, not just empty but nakedly vacated, and felt a strange glow of sensation creep over her. In years to come she would experience a similar sensation when she exercised and trained a little too hard. Sometimes, when she put down a weight, she would find that the muscle of an arm or thigh would feel bigger than it actually was, as if she could feel the skin a quarter of an inch above its actual surface. This feeling was similar, but different, as that first time was mixed with a healthy serving of fear. Next to where the woman had been sitting, written in the condensation gathered on the steamed-up windows, were numbers. She read them and realised in an instant what they signified. It was the date, with the time, 1907, scrawled above. She looked down at her Mickey Mouse watch and knew, more keenly and certainly than she had known anything before, that the woman who had stepped off the bus had less than three hours to live. The next morning, for the first time in her life, Serene chose not to watch her cartoons with breakfast, but instead asked her mother to put on the news. Regarding her daughter closely, Worried for a moment that she might be running a fever or coming down with something, Serene's mother forced up a smile, nodded obligingly, and, rummaging behind a sofa cushion, retrieved the remote and dutifully changed the channel. For a while, as boring men in grey suits waffled on about things important to boring grey-suited people, 
Serene regretted her decision, and, having finished up her cereal, was about to ask her mother to switch the channel back, when she was suddenly jolted into silence. The news, at twenty past the hour, had switched from the international bulletin to local news. A different news anchor, a different studio, and a different top story. A story about someone she recognised. Standing in the rain by dripping melancholy of the scene, the reporter spoke in sombre tones about the sad death of Mrs. Ina Wardlow, a seventy-one-year-old local woman who had been tragically killed when a car's brakes had failed and it had skidded off the road and onto the pavement. The sombre voice was accompanied by a photograph of Mrs. Wardlow, whom the reporter said had left behind one son and two grandchildren. What struck Serene most about this report, however, was not this detail about those who would mourn her passing, but rather the phrase with which it began. It was just after 7 p.m. last night that a man police have named as David Sutcliffe experienced complete brake failure in his Nissan Micra and careened off the road, hitting and tragically killing Mrs. Just after seven, thought Serene, knowing, without any need for confirmation, that the just after was exactly seven minutes. Stunned, Panicked and terrified, Serene did what any nine-year-old would do in such a situation. She burst into tears. Despite sobbing uncontrollably for several hours, during which time she explained to her mother that she recognised the woman as someone she had seen on the bus the previous day, she also invented, seemingly out of thin air, some story about how she had smiled at Mrs. Wardlow and the old woman had winked at her before returning the grin. This, she thought, might be enough to establish a connection and explain to her mother why the death of this complete stranger might have affected her so deeply. Though she elaborated upon this story a little, saying that Mrs. Wardlow had waved to her after leaving the bus, and that she felt really bad about her having been killed, she never once mentioned death. Somehow, that part, despite being the central, most important part of the story, did not seem like it should be shared. That was a private matter, a moment that was meant to remain between her and him, their own special arrangement. For weeks after that, Serene couldn't sleep. Each night she would lie in bed as her mother read a bedtime story, dreading the moment that she would lean over and flip the light switch, the moment when she knew the darkness would come. Somehow, since that day, the dark had become far more threatening. Whereas before she had worried, as all children do, about things beneath the bed and monsters in her cupboard, now it was not the things waiting in the dark that scared her, but rather the dark itself. The same dark, she knew, that had been coiled and sleeping within his bottomless eyes, a dark that threatened to go on forever with no hope of light. Her mother, concerned by her daughter's gaunt appearance and dramatic weight loss, took her to the doctor's office and, when no clear diagnosis was given, proposed taking Serene to the hospital. This sent her daughter into a panic, and she begged, pleaded, and screeched until her mother finally folded and agreed only to take her if her health did not improve or if there was some kind of deterioration. Years later, her mother would remind her of this and how terrified she had been of going to the hospital. In truth, it was not that Serene was scared of hospitals, but rather of who she knew was bound to be there. For a long time after that, things went back to normal, Serene's health improved, she switched schools, and never once saw that strange, hooded figure. After a while, she began to wonder if the apparition had actually been there at all. Was it possible, she wondered, that she might have imagined it? Perhaps dozed off on the bus, cosily warm and cosseted by the engine's steady hum, and dreamt the whole thing. At nine years old, it was more than possible that she had simply linked the story of Mrs. Wardlow with the woman on the bus. They may, in truth, have not even been the same person. 
all of these things, she thought, until it happened again. The next time it happened was in high school. Serene had been fourteen, and her best friend Carla had been passing notes with a boy she had been crushing on all year. Finally, she had worked up the courage to ask, in note form, of course, whether Dale, a dark-haired boy with glasses and an admittedly cute smile, wanted to go to the dance with her on the following Friday. Crazed with nerves, despite the answer being obvious to anyone with eyes, she had nudged Serene with the point of her elbow and slipped her the note to pass back to Dale, which she had secretively done. A few minutes later, Serene received a few minutes later, Serene received a tap on the shoulder and, turning half around in her seat before the teacher looked back, felt the note returned, pressed into her palm by Dale's friend Charlie. Under the table, she had cautiously opened the note and examined the contents. Much to Carla's delight, the word YES was printed in capital letters. Below the words, however, were numbers. Serene spun around in her chair and stared at Dale, who flashed a toothy grin before dipping his head back to his work. Serene looked around the room but saw nothing out of the ordinary, as the teacher called for her to turn around and get on with her work, and she passed the note on to Carla. It was only when she looked to her left at the large classroom windows that looked out onto the football fields that she saw him. There, in the backward image, she saw herself, Carla, and the rest of the class in faded reflection, and there, standing behind Dale, a tall figure in a cloak. Serene screamed, and, rising up from the table, sprinted from the class and toward the girls' bathroom. She didn't return to class, but instead went to see the school nurse, and was sent home. Unlike her, Dale Turner never made it home. On his way back that night, he was hit by a car and killed. Judging by the time he would have left school, that would have been around 4.30 p.m. The numbers on the note were the day's date and 16.28. After that, the thing, as she called it, took on a different character. Death himself only showed now and again, perhaps four or five times a year, but the ability to see to know the exact date and time of another's demise, became clearer, more refined, and almost second nature. Trying, on the one occasion she sought clinical help to explain it, she said that the numbers just came to her. When the therapist pressed her and asked if it was an image or a vision of a gravestone or something, she replied that it was hard to explain. When someone asks you what six times seven is, how do you see the number of the answer? Is it a picture in your head? Do you see the actual numerals in a particular colour? Or do you just know? The therapist hadn't answered, but had instead simply nodded that she understood. She didn't. Since her late teens, whenever she looked at another person, be they young or old, a friend or a stranger, the numbers appeared unbeckoned in her mind's eye, the exact date and time to the minute of their death. At first, when the numbers began to appear in groups rather than being confined to one or two people, she wondered whether she was going mad. It certainly wasn't normal to see the anthropomorphic personification of death wandering the halls of a high school or standing in the doorway of a church. She considered trying to get help, but didn't actually go until much later, and even then, only once. What convinced her that she wasn't crazy was the accuracy. By the time of her twentieth birthday, she had decided to confront the thing and what it implied head-on. If she was to be cursed with this ability, then she needed to get a handle on it, understand its parameters. In the summer of 2014, she visited her grandmother in a hospice and, for the first time, had surreptitiously taken note of the dates that sprang up when she looked at the other residents. 
as painful as it was to have this knowledge, Serene knew within moments of walking into the place which of the residents would die within the next two months, and could predict the time down to the minute. By the time the sixth resident had died according to her numbers, Serene was convinced. The question was then not whether her ability was real, but of what use it could be, and what the hell it meant. For two years she struggled with this question, consulting leaders from various religions presenting her situation as a hypothetical and asking what it might imply about death, God, the universe, and everything. Most could not provide any form of satisfactory answer, but seemed unanimously to have an innate ability to see through the hypothetical phrasing of the question and ask whether she was talking about herself. Be it a priest, a monk, a rabbi, or an imam, they all offered heartfelt and genuine sympathies before falling back on the maxim that if it is God's will, then it is a beautiful thing, and whilst the meaning might not be clear now, she should trust that it would come in time. She left all of them unsatisfied. The thing, as she took to calling it, was a constant distraction. She became highly practised at working out the time between two dates in her head, knowing on sight roughly how long people had left. Sometimes the amount of time allotted seemed entirely random, and, at others, unnervingly cruel. Like the hideous pimp who would live on his profits well into his nineties, whom she had seen standing behind a wan-like girl who wouldn't make it into her mid-twenties, or the overweight alcoholic smoker whose gym-loving son was training with the dream of competing at an event that he wouldn't live to see. Often, it didn't seem fair. Once, when she was sitting in the doctor's waiting room, she listened to two women discussing their upcoming holidays. One particularly loud woman was broadcasting the details of her upcoming getaway to anyone within earshot with such enthusiasm that it made Serene smile and look up from her magazine. What she saw was a large woman of around forty years of age with her two small children playing by her feet. All three had the same date, the times separated by a matter of minutes. Panicked, Serene had interrupted the woman, saying that she had been so impressed by her enthusiasm about the break that she felt like visiting the same place herself. "'Who are you flying with?' she asked with exaggerated curiosity. The woman eyed her suspiciously, noting that her friendly interest seemed to have mutated into something a little too friendly, but gave the name of the airline anyway. Abandoning her appointment with the doctor and sprinting from the room, Serene rushed home, went online, and looked up flights on the date she had seen. Sure enough, the flight was there, the times she had seen being two hours into a four-hour flight. There were no more seats available on the flight. Either by some very curious accident the woman and her children would die within minutes of each other whilst on that plane, or, as she feared, the whole plane was coming down. For the next week she agonized over what to do. The plane, she knew, would be carrying over one hundred passengers. If she did have some way of knowing that the plane was going to crash, that some tragedy was going to befall that many people, then she had a duty to tell them, even if it meant being laughed out of the airport. If she kicked and screamed and made enough of a fuss, at least some of the passengers might be unsettled enough not to take the flight. She explained her plan to go to the airport and cause a scene to Carla, who, despite having a full working knowledge of Serene's thing, had remained her close friend since high school, on the proviso that she never revealed to Carla herself the date hanging over her head. Carla responded by offering to drive Serene to the airport and, if need be, to bail her out once she was arrested. In practice, once Serene was safely in the car, Carla simply drove to a local supermarket, parked the car and made two phone calls from a burner phone, one to the airport and another to the police explaining that there was a bomb aboard the plane with that specific flight number. Then, throwing the phone into a nearby trash can, she took out her own phone and logged onto a flight tracker. Sure enough, the flight was grounded and the whole airport was closed. Then the pair simply sat in the car park 
and waited. Even if it still takes off, the time will be different, Carla said, trailing off as her conclusion was swallowed by the oblivion of the known unknowable. The flight did not take off. In fact, it was rescheduled for the following day, the put-out passengers given a free night in a local hotel, or at least they would have, had the bus carrying them to the hotel not been involved in a six-car pile-up on the highway. It was simply luck that most of the passengers survived. Unfortunately, Donna Lee and her two children were seriously injured and later died in hospital, only minutes apart. The turn of events shook Serene. Questions, possibilities, and permutations raced through her mind in a blur of actions and consequences. If she had not intervened, if the woman and her two girls had been on the flight, would they and the rest of the passengers have avoided the car crash and survived? Or, if they had all made the flight, would the rest also have perished? She had no way of knowing if the times allotted for the others corresponded, or if her actions had changed their times, or if they were never going to be impacted by the flight at all. Surely, if that was the allotted time for the mother and her daughters, then it stood to reason that they would have died when the plane came down. It was the only scenario that made sense, which surely would have killed the others. Or, if she had not intervened, would some other turn of events have led the trio to have missed their flight? Would they still have been killed in some other road traffic accident on their way back from the airport? More frightening still was the idea that, perhaps, her intervention was already figured into the plan. Her actions, meaningless, in trying to fight the inevitable. If so, and there really was no way of escaping what had been written, if... No matter what she did, the outcome would have been the same. Then what did that mean for free will? And, she considered, if she was so impotent, her role just to passively observe, then why did whoever or whatever was making these decisions bother to tell her at all? It was shortly after this incident that Serene had her breakdown. A month later, sitting in the therapist's office, she felt the woman's scepticism like a wall of glass between them. It was as if the doctor could see her but would always be unable to reach her. She would forever remain distanced. Though she was clearly trying to help, or was at least mandated to, her therapist's predictable cynicism and inability to understand Serene's situation made her seem to lack empathy, approaching the meetings with a condescending, I-know-better manner that Serene found it difficult to deal with. Unfortunately, as long as you allow these delusions to rule you, as long as you are unwilling to accept that this is all in your head, then you will be unable to heal, the therapist sighed, leaning back in her chair and peering over her glasses at the notes she had written during their session. The first step is acknowledgement. Without that, she added, pointing at Serene with the nib of her pencil, then the prognosis isn't good. Serene glared at the therapist and watched the numbers form in her head. As she rose to her feet and politely shook the woman's hand and thanked her, she knew already that whatever she decided to do about her thing, her prognosis was infinitely better than the therapist's. Okay, Serene, I am rather busy, but I will see you again in a fortnight, the therapist hissed, looking at her calendar and not at her patient. Serene nodded, though in her head she thought. I doubt that. She walked from the therapist's office, resigned to the idea that if she was going to deal with this thing, it was likely she would need to do it on her own. Well, on her own and with Carla, whose Ford Mondeo rolled quietly into view as she waved enthusiastically out of the window. "'How'd it go?' she asked, beaming with the optimism that Serene had noticed was common amongst those with many decades left to live. Serene was about to answer when she suddenly caught sight of herself, reflected in the car's bodywork. It was a warped, distorted image, pulled and stretched by the curves and angles of the metal, but it was clear enough for her to see herself and behind her. 
just visible in the twisted vision of the street, was a tall, dark figure. Turning quickly, she looked back up the street and saw nothing but an empty road, no figure in sight, but when she turned again to the car, there it was, clear as day. She stepped forward and looked again, this time in the car window, and there he was, around one hundred metres behind her, the tall, dark figure and his scythe. Serene got into the car and told Carla to drive. In all the time she had been seeing death and the numbers, the one person she had never seen numbers for was herself. She had often looked upon this as a blessing, not knowing the day or the hour gave her comfort. Now it seemed, however, that was about to change. Over the next two weeks, Serene saw death sixteen times. Standing alone on a hill opposite the supermarket, across the street as she sat in a café and once at the end of her garden. The message, as she saw it, was clear. He was coming and bringing the darkness with him. All that was missing was the numbers. As each day rolled into the next with no date appearing, Serene became more and more resigned to what she knew was coming— Acting on what she presumed was being communicated to her, Serene began stoically to make her preparations. For weeks she waited, seeing over and over that strange figure, always ever watching. She visited the library and took the time to read up on him, learning as she did the history of death as a character, a personified being— she learnt, for example, that in many Spanish-speaking countries, where the word for death is feminine, the grim reaper figure is seen as a woman. She learned that in Christian and Jewish mythology, the angel of death is named Samael, and that in some traditions he is said to have married Lilith, the mythical character purported to have been Adam's first wife. She learnt, for the first time, the term psychopomp, which to her sounded like a genre of music, but actually referred to figures in mythology responsible for guiding the dead into the afterlife. According to what she read, a psychopomp offered no judgment, was entirely neutral, and displayed no malice or intent. For a while, this idea gave her comfort— until she considered the numbers and the figures creeping inevitable advance. Didn't that show intention and malice? Wasn't the slow, agonizing approach willful and deliberate? Not to mention the curious gift that this thing, God, or providence in its wisdom, had decided to bestow upon her. Wasn't giving her that a deeply malicious act? Was it not, for want of a better word, a curse? She took out life insurance, wrote a will, and, as time went on with the figure of the reaper seemingly getting closer with each appearance, decided to meet with her nearest and dearest to say her goodbyes without them even knowing. Having returned from what she reasoned might be her final meeting with Carla, whom she now regarded almost as a sister, she stepped into her empty apartment and cried. It wasn't fair— not just the thing itself, but the lack of explanation, the total absence of explanation, of guidance or of help. The scariest thing she realised about the darkness was not its eternity or its finality, but rather its apparent lack of meaning. Without meaning, there is no hope. She made her way to the bathroom, with the intention of cleaning herself up, when, again, she caught sight of her reflection in the mirror of the medicine cabinet and saw, with a shudder, a familiar figure standing behind her. The fixed, unwavering grin showing no hint of empathy, no glimmer of remorse. I am death, it seemed to say, without speaking, the end of meaning and hope. Without turning, she spoke into the mirror, addressing this form that stood for something beyond shape or image. "'Why do you never speak?' she asked flatly. "'I mean, why do it? Why show me this stuff if there's no point, no meaning behind it?' 
As she spoke, she felt herself becoming more and more frustrated, felt the fear and anguish of years, of the tragedies and terrors she had been forced to see, the things she'd had no choice but to know, boiling up inside her, and suddenly she no longer felt stoic, no longer wanting to be brave, instead she felt anger, righteous, indignant, and molten swelling within her chest, not at death itself, but at the silence that came with the cruelty the cringing, awful cowardice of simply saying nothing. Answer me, damn it! Answer me! Death did not reply. Instead, he simply stared, looking forever forward with that awful, bottomless stare. That's what I thought you'd say, she muttered as she raised her head, determined to stare right back. As she did, however, she saw, before her in the mirror, forming slowly in the condensation, just as it had the very first time so very long ago, a number, a date, and a time. Silently, she nodded. Two more days. Without saying a word, Serene opened the cabinet, reached inside, and took out the pills, Maybe death had a plan, but maybe she was about to change it. She had just begun to open the bottle, struggling with the childproof cap, when another date appeared, next to the first. It was a date sixty years into the future. Then, below that, another twenty years later, and another eighty years after that. The dates kept coming stretching at awkward, limping, irregular intervals one after another for at least the next two hundred years. In two days' time, Serene would go to her death, probably never knowing what the thing was supposed to mean or what it was for. Looking at the succession of dates, however, seeing how they stretched long into the future, who they were for, and what they implied, she smiled. She didn't have her answer now, but perhaps she would have a lot more chances to one day figure it out. This has been Death and Serene, a short horror story, written by Michael Vandervoort, narrated by Robin McConnell, copyright 2023 by Michael Vandervoort, production copyright by Michael Vandervoort.